I mean, are you like Paul today? Are you in prison? I mean, maybe your prison is illness. Maybe you've got some infirmities. Maybe your prison would be persecution. Maybe there's some assaults laid upon you. Maybe your prison is, is a family or friends. Maybe your prison is, is a husband or a wife. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe your prison is finances. Afraid the phone's going to ring because the bill collector's going to be there. Maybe your prison is just your own restlessness of heart and spirit. You're looking around you and you feel like I ought to have something I don't have. Others have it and I need it. I want it. That discontent. Maybe your prison is just, a, just an angry spirit. Resentment about something that's been done to you in the past. Maybe your prison is just a sense of a total lack of well-being. <laughs> I was at the doctor last week and he says, how is your sense of well-being doing? And I thought, what? <laughs> I'm wanting to know about how my heart's beating and you're wanting to know about my, well, my sense of my well-being? He says, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would it be? I said, 15. He looked at me like, huh? I said, what are you talking about? And I got to thinking about that. People, that's a good question that a doctor might ask you. And people feel imprisoned and trapped and alienated and all those kind of things, the psychological, mental, internal things that we struggle with with our internal talk to ourselves. If you're in prison today, Paul was in prison when he wrote this. And in prison, Paul could say, I know who I am. And I know what I'm doing. And I know who I'm doing it for. And I know the assignment that I'm on is the assignment of what God's doing. I'm a part of what God's doing. And my circumstances aren't where I determine who I am, what I'm doing, who I belong to, or what, I'm, what my job is. I'm not looking out here about, about my circumstances and how I feel about them. I'm looking to one thing, and that's who God's made me in Christ Jesus. And I say, glory to God. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this book. Because that's the way I want to be. Now, all of that is not cliches and euphemisms to Paul. There are going to be 154 more verses where he gives you details about what that's going to mean. This is not just mindless dribble and talk. This is substantive reality about what God's doing, and I've got this grand, this comprehension of this grand cosmic design that God has in His Son, and He's made me a part of it. And I get excited about it. I mean, when Paul starts the book, he's telling you everything he's going to tell you. And you, 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 you hear it and you say, boy, this, this grand epistle shows that unbelievably explosive joy that this guy had, this prisoner for Jesus Christ had in his Lord and in his salvation and in his will and in his grace and his good pleasure and his glory and his calling and his inheritance and his power and at his right hand and just knowing him. No wonder you get down to verse 15 and he starts praying. For, he just burst out praying. And what does he pray? Verse 17, that he'd give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I sit some time over a verse and say, Lord, I, I, I'm not getting this passage. Help me. <laughs> And I, when I do, I do that. I used to do that years ago, and I'd put the verses up, and I'd struggle, and I'd say, Lord, I need some help here, you know. And, and it was like he'd say, he never said it back to me, but it, my, my, my conscience would say back to him, he said, 
Well, you may need help. He gave you the help. There it is on the verses up there. The page is right there in front of you. What's the matter? You can't see? And so, I, you know, I'd just keep studying, and sooner or later the light would dawn, and if it didn't, well, then it didn't. But sooner or later... But then it came to dawn on me that, you know, the light and the knowledge wasn't just in the details of the verse. It was in the light of the... It was a, the revel, wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I'm getting to know him. Man, that's wonderful. 42 years ago, if you'd have said, do you know Cynthia Howell? I'd have said, yeah, she's that pretty little blonde gal right over there. She's got eyes for me, have you noticed? <laughs> We walked down, she walked down an aisle, met me in front of, an, uh, of, a, front of a church. My uncle, was, who was her pastor, pronounced his husband and wife, and we left out of that bill, and she was Cynthia Jordan. I changed her identity, and then she changed me. I tell guys standing at the, I see, you know, when she's standing back there, she's got three word th things on her mind, I'll alter him. Say it quickly. That's what's on her mind. <laughs> and it might as well be because that's what's going to happen. And the two of you will become so transformed into something new, into one new person. And so we can joke about it because it's wonderful, not because we don't like it. If there wasn't truth in it, there wouldn't be any humor in it. But if there, if, because there is value beyond the ability to express, we rejoice in it. And that's what's going on here. And Paul said, I know, what, I know who I am. And I know the transformation. And I'm a part of this great thing God's doing. And it isn't just for me. To the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faith. See, I got all this, but it's not just so that I can have it. <laughs> I got it together. Look at me. It isn't that. It's I've got this because God working through me has, it, has, a, has a, a target out there. The saints. Now, when we go through Ephesians, we're going to find out the saints weren't always saints. Ryan said it earlier. Once you was lost. And you're going to find some of the most horrific descriptions of you, the mo some of the most accurate portrayals of you, you'll ever find anywhere right here in the book of Ephesians as a lost person. Dead in sin. By the way, that's the real problem with lost people. It's not what they're doing. It's that they're dead. See, you can, be, you can be doing, it's not the bad they're doing or the good they're doing, it's the fact that they're dead. Either way, it's just a stinking mess. It's unacceptable. Cut off. Not because of what they're doing, but because of who they are. Separated from God. But not just that. Dominated. Driven by the adversary, by an unwelcomed and unloving Lord, driven by the lust of the flesh, by that self-serving, I'll do it my way, or hit the highway. But God, who's rich in mercy, I, and I almost can't wait to get to Ephesians 2, that great grace factory, but God was rich in mercy for his great love when he loved us. What did he do? He completely transformed us. Put us in his son. Killed us there. Made us dead. Took away our sin. Gave us his life. Then put his, took that life and lives it out through us. Made us new creatures. Made us his workmanship created, here it is, in Christ Jesus unto good works which he before ordained that we should walk in them. Wow, you say, oh, man, what do you... You see, in, in Ephesians, saints aren't dead people. <laughs> That's in religion, they're dead people. Sinners are dead people. 
in religion, they're alive and they're trying to, you know, I'm alive, I'm trying to work. And God said, no, nope, you're dead. I put you in Christ, now you're alive. You're a saint. Saints in, the, in Ephesians are alive people, living people who are in Christ. New creatures in him. What a wonderful thing. But he doesn't just save you so you'd be saved. Just to keep you out of hell. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? But he saves so you can grow up and be faithful. And the Ephesians were that. We're going to see when we get over in Ephesians chapter 1. Pe people don't like that part in Ephesians for chapter 1 verse 1 where it says, At Ephesians, at Ephesus. People say, That ought to be left out. Oh, nonsense. It shouldn't be left out. It's crazy. You've got two little manuscripts that don't have it. Both of them have the place for it. One of them has it in the margin, but they don't have it in the text. The two little manuscripts that don't, that deny the deity of Christ, deny, you know, he, they, if you want to follow that kind of stuff, go ahead. Wind up in the ditch. It's okay with me. It's not okay with me. But to leave it out of this passage is foolish. But people don't like it. Because they say, well, there's not enough personal stuff in Ephesians. Paul spent three years at Ephesus, by the way. He spent three, we'll look at it next time. He spent three exhausting years of ministry in Ephesus, proclaiming the gospel and doing the work of the ministry, and he struggled and, and pled with those that opposed him at the great religious center to the Queen of Heaven at Ephesus. For three years he shed tears over the souls of the Ephesians. He says that in Acts 20, he said, For night and day, for three years I, I wept over you. And the end result was a body of believers that he could call, not just the saints, but faithful in Christ Jesus, fully functioning. And you see it in chapter 1. You get on down there, and he'll say to them, since he, there, there are people in Ephesus that he's writing to. He didn't even know them. He just heard of their faith. <laughs> what happened? After he left there, some folks got saved that weren't saved under his. He didn't lead them to Christ. The saints that he left there kept doing the work of the ministry. You want to see one of the most explosive ministries in the Bible? Go back and read Acts 19. We'll do that in our next study or two. He just blew the whole territory up with the gospel. And when he left, he left saints that were carrying on the work of the ministry. They didn't need him there stroking them, patting them, pushing them forward. They just kept on with it. They were faithful. And, you know, faithfulness shows up in a lot of ways. It might show up, the book would tell you, with you showing up for work on time. I mean, you want to keep your word to your employer. It might show up by you just cleaving to your spouse because you want to keep the promise that you made to them. It might show up by you just showing up at church and, and supporting the work of the ministry because you made the commitment to the work to work in unity with the, with the saints when you became attached to the local assembly. All of those things we're going to see. Now that's all in the second half. Ephesians is in two parts. The first three chapters and then the second three chapters. The first three chapters talk about what it means to be a saint. The second three chapters about what it, how you demonstrate the faithful. The first three chapters talk about your calling. The second three chapters about your conduct. The first three chapters are doctrine. The second three chapters are the duty that comes out of the doctrine. The first three chapters are here's what you believe, and then here's how you behave because of what you believe. Here's your wealth. Here's your walk. Here your, here's your blessings. Here's the behavior. Where does that second section come from? See, well, we, we put that first. We, we want to say, oh, we get the, we'll, we'll get the walk and, and the behavior and the conduct and all that ahead. And we get that, and then we'll get the blessings. No, God says, you need to understand the blessings, understand who you are, so you can understand how who you are lives and walks. Never come to the place where you think that you're Progress in the Christian life is going to be enhanced based on your performance. It's enhanced by understanding who Christ is. But when you understand who he is and who, he, what he's, who he's made you, you know what? Christ in you, the hope of glory, begins to live out through you. So that's where we are. Paul, he knew who he was. An apostle. 
That's what I do of Jesus Christ. That's who I do it for, by the will of God. That's my authority. That's what I'm a part of. To the saints, there's my target. And to the faithful, that's the ultimate goal, fully functioning believers in Christ Jesus. When you come to the end of Ephesians, you'll be able to say, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is who I do it for. This is what I'm a part of. This is the goal. All because I'm in Christ. We're going to have a good time. The name Ephesians, in the dictionaries that tell you what names mean, one of the meanings of, of, of Ephesians is desirable ones. I pray God would put a desire in our heart to be nothing less than who he's made us in Christ Jesus. Personally, individually, as, as an assembly for his glory. If you're here this morning and, you've not, and you don't know for sure that you're in Christ, maybe you know you're in a church. But you don't know for sure you're in Christ. Maybe you know, like Paul, you have a religious pedigree but you've never really been apprehended in a personal, individual encounter with Jesus Christ. You can have that this morning. He's already moved heaven and earth to provide it for you because he left heaven and came to earth at midnight, lived among us as one of us, died and was raised again to give us his life, to give you his life. The moment you trust him, the moment you say, I can't, I understand my bankruptcy, my inability, my brokenness, and I'll just trust him. That instant, God will save you. He'll take you out of who you are in yourself and an Adam and all the rest and put you into his son. It won't be something you feel, you experience, you have to do something to gain. It's something God does in your inner man. And you know it because of what his word tells you. And when you know it's true, it's the fact, your faith resting on the fact, that allows the fruit to come. The feeling comes after that. The experience comes after possessing the reality of it. You've never trusted him. You do that this morning, and God will save you. Make a new creature out of you. And you'll go out of here today. You could have come in Saul, and you could leave Paul. And if you are saved today, and you do have that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, could I encourage you, take it personally. Our Father, we thank you today for life in Christ Jesus, for this wonderful calling, this wonderful ability to know who we are, what we're doing, who we belong to, what we're a part of, and what our task is, all because of being in Christ. And I just pray these things would be as rich and real to us as they are to you, for your glory, in Christ's name.